Hi students, we we'll continue chapter 16 from Microeconomics Spin Rubenfeld, uh, Information, Market Failure and the Role of Government. Uh, this is uh, section 16.3, Equity and Efficiency. In the last video, we look at the contract curve, okay, uh, the, the contract curve which came from the Edgeworth box. And uh, yeah, so here we are now at Utility Possibilities Frontier. The frontier shows the levels of satisfaction that each of the two people that we investigated just now achieve what they have traded to an efficient outcome on the contract curve. Okay, so point E, F, G are efficient points, examples of e efficient points. Yeah. Um, uh, so O, James, that means here zero, if we choose this point, for instance, Karen utility is highest, while James utility is zero. But this is uh, for the two goods. Huh? And then you can have other combinations where James utility can be zero, uh, can be maximum, while Karen's utility can be zero. But this is still the efficient, uh, 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 depending on the negotiating power and the preferences, right? But these are the possibilities of utility efficient utility points okay so if we have a point that is below the uh, utility frontier such as H H will be inefficient because any trade within the shaded area will make one or both people better off okay so if you choose this point it could be lower than you know at this utility point uh, James could have gotten more utility for this uh, utility point Karen could have gotten more utility so it is not efficient yeah it is not efficient but L on the other hand is unattainable okay so again, you can do the comparison at this point. Uh, at this point, where Karen is enjoying this utility, James will only have this amount. Okay, it will be impossible to achieve uh, the two uh, utility, com the combination of utility with uh, such as L. So it's a curve showing all efficient allocations of resources measured in terms of utility levels of two individuals. Yeah. So whether they are, we have established now that they are efficient through our analysis with the Edgeworth box and then the uh, contract curve and the utility frontier. The other question that um, that is discussed in economics is whether those efficient points are also equitable. Huh? Are they, you can say, just or fair or equitable or equal equality? No, no. Does it, does it, does it give a sense of equality? So, in this kind of discussions, usually we bring in the social welfare debate. Yeah, that um, how do you measure uh, social welfare, and what is the um, uh, uh, relationship between efficiency and equity? Okay, so, uh, but. Welfare and equity is very much a normative subject and there are different views of how equity would be, uh, is normally defined. The egalitarian view is that all members of society receive equal amounts of goods, regardless of status, regardless of needs, regardless of whatever. Yeah, so this is, um, like you see, right, everyone should be receiving universal basic income of this much, for instance. Uh, the Rossian, the Rossian uh, view of equity is that they should try to maximize the utility of the least well-off person. Okay, so least well-off person. That means you look at the last one, the one most behind in the society, and this person's uh, utility should be brought up to the level that is uh, average or to the level that is considered decent, uh, comparable with other people in the society.
Okay. The utilitarian uh, view of equity maximizes total utility of all members of society. So it views not one or the, 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 the one at last to as the end or the one uh, as a whole. Yeah, it maximizes total utility of all members of the society together. And then market oriented says that only way to be fair is to let the market decide because the market has a as an invisible hand, no preference, no normative uh, function. So, uh, market should decide automatically, yeah, We're using price signals and, and ability to pay demand and supply and so on, to allocate goods and services. And that will be most equitable. All right. So, these are the four views of equity. Now, let's see how okay, we can try to fit equity uh, with the perfect competition. Okay, perfect competition. So, the theorem tells us that any equilibrium need deemed to be equitable can be achieved by a suitable distribution of resources among individuals that such a distribution not, need not in itself generate inefficiency. So, what is the distribution that uh, generate that the distribution itself creates efficiency or the distribution itself is not inefficient uh, and this is where a lot of countries are struggling eh? we talk about social protection giving assistance to the people whereas that assistance itself is also done in an efficient way okay there are a lot of transaction costs there are a lot of delivery costs uh, leakages a lot of uh, work um, cost that shouldn't be there in the first place. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's look at efficiency in production. Uh, we are going to look at two types of efficiency here. One is input efficiency, which also which is also called technical efficiency. The condition where firms combine food uh, combine inputs to produce given output as inexpensively as possible. That means they they combine resources together. Yeah? Remember, firm's function is to combine resources in the most inexpensive way possible. Okay, uh, So that is called technical efficiency. And the uh, formula, this comes from the idea of marginal productivity of resources. Yeah, that marginal the efficiency of using resources if you look at them separately would be MPL equals to the marginal cost of having resources. For example, the marginal productivity of labor must be equal to the marginal sorry the MRP, right? Okay, the MRP of producing labor must be equal to uh, using uh, the marginal cost of using labor. So, in other words, MP equals to W. And then MPK equals to R. Yeah, this is the marginal productivity of capital. Must be reflected in, in R. So, if you put them together, it will be MP... L over MPK equals to W over R <coughs> in equilibrium when you have more than one good, more than one input. But we also showed that the ratio of the marginal products to the two inputs is equal to the marginal uh, rate of substitution. Okay, margin, uh, ma marginal rate of technical substitution of labor for capital, which is MRTS. MRTS is equal to W over R. Okay, you would change from using labor to using capital if the rate of substitution is the, if the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the ratio of price of labor to the price of capital okay if you change if you, your rate of substitution is higher than the ratio of price then that means you are not at equilibrium yeah? you are paying more than what you should pay so you don't have that balance I think we have done this before in previous, uh, in previous chapters so the production possibility frontier here 
shows the combination of two goods that can be produced with fixed quantities of output. So these are possibilities again. So you can choose the extreme points or you can choose combinations in between. You can't uh, anything in be inside here will be inefficient. Anything outside will be unattainable. Okay, and the part about the slope is uh, where you have a concave PPF. A concave PPF means that your MRTS is not constant. Okay, so the slope increases, yeah, the MRTS increases as the level of production of food increases. And this is why, uh, the, the reason is because your input are not perfectly uh, the argument substitutable. Okay. All right. So what is the MRTS to produce? Uh, we we've seen pre uh, earlier. MRTS is the amount of one good that must be given up to produce one additional unit. So if you want to increase food, you'll have to reduce clothing. Or if you want to increase clothing, you have to reduce food. So what is the substitution here? So every point along the frontier, the condition is um, that, that there is a marginal rate of substitution. Eh? But the equilibrium or the efficient point is when the marginal rate of substitution here, eh? the amount of goods, let's say this is uh, one, over 1 or maybe 10 over 10 so it ends up as 1 right uh, it must equals to the ratio of the MC marginal cost of producing food and the marginal cost of producing over marginal cost of producing clothing so okay why is MR, M, uh, MRT shows the rate of substitution of goods? MF, MC shows the uh, cost of additional uh, getting this addition, the additional food over the cost of getting the additional clothing. Okay, so they must be um, efficient. Uh, they must be equal. Now I'll show you an example of okay before we go there. Right. Let's take B point B here. At point B, the MRT is one. Right. The MRT is one. At point D, the MRT is how much does it take for you to move from one point to another will be 2 over 1. Okay. At point D. So your MRT is 2. But in terms of the cost, this MRT equals to 1. Eh? Uh, it could be one hundred dollars over one hundred, and this one could be one hundred sixty over eighty. The example is given in the textbook. Okay, that this is the MC for F over MC you see. All right. That is the input efficiency. Output efficiency happens on this condition. MRS equals to MRT. Okay. Now, output efficiency happens when MRS equals to MRT. So, instead of transformation, because this one is the input, uh, how you transform uh, from input to output, that means the combination process there. But S is something else marginal rate of substitution so this one is on the output or on the consumer side this one is on the production combination side 
yeah, or the production decision. So, MRS describes consumers' willingness to pay for additional unit of food by consuming less clothing. It's how they decide. Yeah? So MRS will be reflected on or, or represented by the indifference curve. Okay, and the efficiency between the input and output, the output efficiency and input efficiency will be, will be observed when MRS equals to MRT. Yeah, that means the slope of the two uh, curves are the same, and that happens at C. Yeah, again at the tangent point. Right. And if you were to draw a line here, this MRS equals to MRT. Yes, this will be represented by a price ratio line, yeah, or anything. But that point. When we say a slope of something is uh, a slope of a point which is on, on a non-linear curve, then we are looking at the slope of the tangent line that touches this, isn't it? So this is a tangent line that touches the PPF and also the indifference curve. So this tangent line slope, let's say the slope here equals to 1. So that means MRS equals to MRT equals to 1. Okay, because in math, the tangent line represents the slope at that point on a non-linear curve. Alright, so let's put everything together. You will see that uh, efficiency in output markets happens at, uh, at MRS equals to the price ratio just now. Okay, so this is where we now bring in price ratio. And since MRS must equal MRT and then MRT remember MRT must equal the uh, MRT must equal MCF over MCC uh, and then so you can put all together the MRS yeah? all the contents of MRS equals to MRT and then the whole expansion there right so you will see that the price ratio here is uh, the ratio, the slope of this price ratio, yeah, the price ratio here should be equal to the MRT, MRS, and on the graph, okay, on the graph, the most, uh, this is the PPF and then you have U1 and U2. If you use, because MRS equals MRT, the competitive output market is efficient. Eh? Uh, so you need to find the MRT which is equals to the price ratio. So the price, the, it's not that the MRT change, but the price will change, the price will adjust. Uh, if you your if you're if you're using a price that has not equal MRT, then they will that price may be too low. If it is too low, it will create excess demand. If it is too high, it will create excess supply. Right? And you know market will react. When there's excess demand, they will buy uh, less of it and price will go up. Uh, and then you know if you have excess supply they will buy uh, um, prices will go down so all these adjustments will bring price ratio back to the equilibrium which is equals to the MRT equals to the MRS okay and that's why your final equilibrium is at C and this is the consumption for uh, the market Okay. All right. So just quickly, uh, sixteen point five. I'm sure you recall your section, uh, the chapters on international trade from from principles. Uh, the concept of comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is when the country has the lower opportunity cost. 
So, yeah, comparative advantage. Which country has a lower opportunity cost of producing a good? So that country should uh, specialize. And when it specializes in one product, it will export that product and import the one that it does not specialize. So it will trade. Okay. Absolute advantage is different. The idea of absolute advantage is that it has lower cost. Not lower opportunity cost, just lower cost. Okay, so now let's look at the example of Holland and Italy. This is the number of hours, yeah, which is we can say cost, lah, yeah, because the, they're using labor. So the number of hours required to produce cheese and wine. Holland will require one hour to produce one pound of cheese, but two hours to produce wine. Italy use uh, six hours to produce one cheese and three hours to produce wine. Okay, three hours of labor to produce one gallon of wine. So we uh, obviously Holland is cheaper. When we look at this, Holland is a cheaper producer. Okay, so Holland has got absolute advantage in cheese. Right? Yeah, and now wine. Again, you see that Holland is a cheaper producer. So it has the absolute advantage in production of wine as well. Okay, so the absolute advantage goes uh, to Holland for wine and also for cheese. Now let's check the comparative advantage. Holland produce one pound if it has one pound, uh, sorry, one hour of labor. Uh, what could it produce better? Yeah? Opportunity cost is lower. So to produce one cheese, it will sacrifice uh, to produce one cheese, it will sacrifice two wine. For Italy to produce uh, one cheese, it will sacrifice 0 0.5. So Sorry, uh, to produce one wine, yeah, one gallon of wine, it was sacrificed two cheese. So, it is clear from comparative advantage analysis that Holland has the comparative advantage for cheese, and Italy has comparative advantage for wine. Okay. So what happens when they trade? Now let's use the same idea of the PPF uh, that we had just now. If the country trade, you, uh, you start from A. Sorry, where were you? You start from A, yeah? A is the pre-trade. It's the pre-trade point. So for Holland, this is this uh, graph is for Holland. This is Holland's PPF. So pre-trade is uh, one and two. This is at point A. Okay, but if we trade, remember, uh, it's one to two. This is a pre-trade. But let's say they choose to trade, and the uh, the the. Okay, so I'm showing the pre-trade price here. This is the price line. Eh? And therefore, this is the equilibrium, which is at the tangent point of U1 and the PBF. Okay, and the price is this purple line. So this is the pre-trade price or pre-trade ratio of price. Okay, now if you trade at... Uh, let's say a price ratio of 1 1 okay and that 1 1 is given this one this is the price line so this is the price line and eh? the dotted purple line is the price line uh, in terms of the PPF, 
the country will be producing at B uh, because it is tangent to the PPF at B here. So it will be producing C, B or cheese, uh, cheese at that point. Uh, but since it needs less or since it can sell, yeah, it can reach another indifference curve because it can uh, sell something to get to buy something at a cheaper rate yeah, at a cheaper product, uh, opportunity cost so the utility has shifted to a higher utility on the right so let's say the next best highest utility you can get is u2 that is tangent that is tangent to the same world price line just now so you can have point d here Okay, so you are not necessarily on the same, uh, on the old U2, yeah? Because now we trade, it has allowed you to get something more uh, than what you would get if you produce everything yourself, if you were self-sufficient. So, this D is the amount that you can export, yeah? So, C, uh, sorry. Is the amount that you can so between CB and CD is the amount that you can export, and the country itself will only need to cost consume zero to CD. This one in terms of cheese, yeah, but it will now able, able to enjoy it. Uh, uh, it is now will need to produce only this much of wine and still enjoy the balance which came from import are you clear yeah so this is the amount that they produce uh, themselves so this uh, produce and consume produce and consume and this one produce and export this one produce and consume and this one import and consume so how is this in terms of uh, comparing with the original position which is pre-trade with pre-trade now you are uh, with trade you are able to consume more at D yeah? this is domestic because you can now have C but also higher wine Compared to this one just now, you may have, but you have very little wine. Yeah? So the, the gain from trade here, yeah, compared to the loss from trade, this box versus this box is larger. So you have a positive gain from trade. Alright, but uh, in reality, when, we, when a country decides to specialize in uh, when the country decides to specialize, that means it will produce more cheese and you, as you have seen just now, it will produce less of wine, right? So from A here, you cut down to this point. Uh, but from C here, yeah, you, cut, you increase the production of cheese. So this is what we call structural change, yeah? Sectoral, sorry, sectoral adjustment. Yeah, or industrial adjustment. In other words, you cut down on uh, farming because you don't, uh, or vineyard uh, production of uh, wine involves farming, but you increase um, livestock. Yeah, you increase dairy pro uh, uh, breeding of animals, of livestock because you want more milk and you want more cheese. So you see there's adjustment between sectors in the economy happening. And when that happens, not just the machines or the, 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 the physical uh, inputs are different, but the labour will also needs to be adjusted. Yeah? What could be labour intensive or less labour intensive, skills will be different. So a lot of, of things can happen uh, with the, the adjustments that, 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 that comes from adjusting from adjusting for trade okay so please read more now section 16.6 .6 gives you an overview of all the efficiency conditions just now efficiency in exchange efficiency in input use 
efficiency in the output market. Okay. So you can go through them uh, quickly. Uh, uh, make sure you understand all those conditions. 16.7 is why markets fail. Now, why markets fail means that why are they not efficient and also why, also why they are not... Uh, equitable is very hard to answer, eh? but why are they not efficient given all those conditions? No, so markets fail for four reasons. Market power, incomplete information, externalities and public goods okay so this is these are the four reasons which you can uh, we can uh, look at uh, market by market analysis and see what kind of what kind of uh, reasons or what kind what category of um, issues yeah, under these four issues eh, that cause the market to fail that cause the market not to be efficient okay all right, so 